Well, hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thanks for being here today. Well, I want to continue talking a little bit about some of the themes that we were getting into uh, with the videos I did a couple weeks ago about Skinwalker Ranch and that newer book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Uh, that book talked a lot about the special types of experiences that the researchers had out there under the uh, DIA's OSAP program. And uh, they did verify that there were uh, entities out there and types of what we call cryptids that they couldn't identify, balls of light, UFOs, and a whole range of rather strange phenomena that we normally don't see as part of uh, our reality. Well, I think there's a, there's a reason why we haven't looked at these phenomena, and we'll, we'll get in another time, you know, to the so social or cultural or religious reasons why we don't like to talk about these topics. Part of it has to do with simply what I believe is a gap in scientific knowledge. And I'm specifically talking about the types of energies that uh, we encounter being, you know, denizens of planet Earth. You've all heard about the idea of ne these neutrinos, these small uh, neutral uh, energetic particles that uh, Wolfgang Pauli suggested might exist. And then uh, Enrico Fermi actually proposed the idea of a tiny little subatomic particle uh, that he called the neutralino. Uh, he was actually not even allowed to publish that in Nature magazine back in the 1930s. Why? The editors of Nature thought the idea of another tiny little particle that was very difficult to detect was just too weird. Where have you heard that before? So the idea of the neutrino wasn't published for a while, even though Fermi, who later went on to work on the Manhattan Project uh, with the atomic bomb, uh, he wasn't allowed to publish that idea. Well, we now know that neutrinos do exist, and you've probably heard of the idea of uh, excuse me, solar neutrinos solar neutrinos that come from the sun. Now, these are very small, tiny particles that we're told they're so small, they don't even interact with us. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to conferences or presentations where people talk about neutrinos, and the idea always was that they're so small, they don't interact with anything at all, and there could be like a billion solar neutrinos. These are produced from... Uh, atomic nuclear reactions uh, they're so small a billion of them are going through your hand every second but you never know they're there no one knows they're there because they're really tiny they're hard to detect um, and the idea was they could go for 10 light years in lead 10 years moving at the speed of light through solid lead before a neutrino would even collide with a lead atom. That's how small they are. They would just go for years and years moving between uh, atomic particles because they're so tiny they never collide with anything. So those type of solar neutrinos are really small and they're kind of insignificant, right? Uh, they just don't really matter to our particular reality and they have to have these very sensitive detectors in Antarctica and other places set up just to see if they can get a, you know a collision with one of these neutrinos with a particle that we could measure perhaps you know we could record the event as a flash of light or something those are solar neutrinos but there is another type of neutrino out there the relic neutrino and this is something that i learned about recently from reading this amazing book by alexander parkhamov space earth human now this was originally written in Russian, there was a Kickstarter program project from Bob Greener and the folks at the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, you know, the folks that are looking into Leonard and Cold Fusion, fascinating stuff. And Greener took the time to create the Kickstarter project and uh, translate this into English. 
Now, what we learned from this book is there's been a huge amount of knowledge that we haven't been exposed to that scientists in other countries have been looking at, specifically other types of cosmic background radiation that affect us. And here's the interesting point about this book is that these primordial neutrinos that come from a relic of the Big Bang, uh, right around the period of the Big Bang, just a second after, we're told, these particles are all over the place. They're streaming throughout the universe and they're gravitationally lensed by things like the sun, by the earth, by the moon, by other galaxies. And as these relic neutrinos, which are relatively slow, somewhere on the order, not nowhere near the speed of light, maybe 10% of the speed of light, they're slow. They have a larger wavelength than the solar neutrinos. And the wavelength is on the order of microns to millimeters. So that means that the energy of these neutrinos, which are always streaming down on us, interacting with all biological systems all the time, the so-called de Broglie wavelength of these particles um, is large enough that it interacts with us, with cells, with groups of cells. If you look at this chart, which I'll put up here, you'll see that a single uh, primordial neutrino, slow neutrino as they're called, uh, would interact with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, atomic particles at the same time in contrast to the solar neutrino, which would be really small and would not act or interact with anything. So we haven't really talked about this. Now, the CERN theory group in Switzerland at the uh, CERN facility have concluded that these uh, relic neutrinos, you could think of them as like active neutrinos compared to the other types of neutrinos that don't interact with us so much. These active neutrinos are a component of dark matter. And we know from all the research into cosmology, something that I was exposed to way back at the University of Arizona going to lectures about astronomy and cosmology because it was a very, you know, the University of Arizona had a very strong department in uh, cosmology, astrophysics. Uh, and back in the 80s, this is a really big mystery of dark matter. I don't think dark energy was a big topic back then, but it became bigger later. But dark matter is this sort of substance that has gravitational effects that we can't see, we can't detect directly, but it has to be there given the sort of motion of our galaxy. There's not enough stars and material out there to hold galaxies together. So, you know, astrophysicists uh, believe that there's other material out there that we can't see, which wouldn't be surprising. And that's the whole point, is there's matter that we can't see. And some of it, a part of it, are these active primordial neutrinos. And so this is going to open up, in my view, a whole new area of science because there's variations in how these primordial neutrinos gravitationally lens around the sun. There's always been these anomalies around the times of solar eclipses, where you get different motions in pendulums, so something that Maurice Elias, a NASA a scientist, discovered back in the 50s. There are variations uh, in the position of the sun and the earth and the solar system in regards to subatomic decay rates, seed germination times, noise in transistors. These are all some of the things that Parkamov talks about in this book. And even in the fields that we're familiar with here, remote viewing, we've always, we've always had this idea of sidereal time. You've heard about this. Ed May used to talk about this at the conferences. Ed May, one of the RV researchers that ran uh, Stanford Research Institute, as it was called at the time after uh, Hal Putoff and Russell Targ uh, left. And uh, Ed Mays talked many times about sidereal time in lectures that I've seen him give, which is the idea that remote viewing ability 
get this, depends on where the Earth is in relation to the center of the Milky Way. Now, why would that matter? Uh, is it due to these primordial neutrinos? Because these primordial neutrinos kind of lens and flow based on gravity of other objects that are out there. Well, we don't know if sidereal uh, time, the effect of sidereal time matters so much in terms of uh, RV, but apparently sidereal time does affect RV ability up to 40%. In other words, when the Earth you're on the side of the Earth facing into the center of the galaxy, our viability is apparently less. Now, I don't know if that's due to active neutrinos or not. It could be due to cosmic rays and high energy particles of another type, but it does suggest the idea, something that is still really new to me, that our position of our Earth relative to the Milky Way and other galaxies even could affect biological processes. It's a really uh, big idea and, and something that we haven't considered before, that something from outside the Earth could affect our biology here, our chemical processes, our nuclear processes, that there's variation that we've never been told very much about because all these processes have been, uh, nuclear decay have assumed to have been fixed and there's nothing that could, nuclear decay rates, that there's nothing could affect them. But there seems to be something that does affect them and Parkamov, and other scientists that have been working in uh, uh, Russia have been talking about this for a long time. So it suggests that there's some other aspects of cosmic energies, something that's been talked a lot about in uh, different Taoist and martial arts traditions where there's this idea of chi and energy, prana, if you would like, that biological systems create and that gets into the whole idea of pk psychokinesis people's ability to project energy and move and bend and shape materials without physically touching them something i've seen demonstrations of while i was in japan so i think this connects a lot of those ideas i think it's um, very important so thanks a lot for watching and we will talk about this again more in the future and we'll see you in the next video take care for now and bye